Okay, so I'm going to talk about absolute holes for the upper middle class. And I have to tell you, the emphasis there is on upper. So although I am in fact teaching you for free, this is not a one-on-one -on -one space in the sense that if you make only twice the medium household income in America, then I'm sorry, you're probably not going to find this very useful. At least, not yet, you know, growth mindset. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll mention a couple of numbers as I go along, but I'm not going to put any emphasis on, on that because nobody can remember it five minutes after the talk ends. So, my goal is just to make you aware that certain procedures, <laughs> certain tricks exist to uh, to actually use them, you will have to do a certain amount of, of Googling and, and research yourself. And, you know, use your own judgment on whether these these tricks apply to your particular situation. I have a question. Yes. How will we distinguish the joke from the professional tax advice? <laughs> <laughs> that is in That's the, where the joke is. The reason why this is not a one on one space. This is taxes. 201, and as you are no longer freshmen, you are expected to use your own judgment in that yes. matter as well. <laughs> Just like I said. <laughs> so it's it's customary to uh, mention what has been done previously, and I'm going to call back all the way to the 19th century, when people faced both death and taxes with a very present help from the supernatural. So. <laughs> Um, the, the Scottish national poet Robert Burns, no less, you know, this is Shakespeare of Scotland, wrote a poem or song in which the chorus goes, The deals are bad, the deals are bad, the deals are bad with its eyes, mum. <laughs> uh, where the deal is Scots for the devil. And similarly, uh, Aspion's Namu, who are, now I'm on the other side of my ancestry, who are the Norwegian equivalents of the Brothers Grimm, collected a folk tale which I shall now relate to you because uh, it, it illustrates the difference between professing something and actually believing it. So once upon a time there was a taxman of the very worst sort. You, you know the kind of person who would, uh, who would as soon uh, size you up for uh, what your hide might be worth as at the market as say, a lot of your taxes. And so one day the devil came to him and said, you know, everywhere I go, I hear nothing but, I wish the devil had that guy. And so now I've come to fulfill the people's wishes and take you away to hell. But the taxman says, well, you know, if, if you do nothing but what people want, then boy, you'll have your work cut out all day. So how about I, I get a chance to speak for myself, to tell my, my side of it. And they argue for a while. The taxman is, of course, a, a college-educated person and, and <coughs> articulate and, and all that. And so eventually they compromise. And the devil says that they'll, they'll walk down the, the road a little while. And if they come across somebody who damns somebody else, then the devil will take that person in view of the taxman. But the devil adds that this damnation must come from the heart. So they walk down the road a while, and they come up on a farm where the farmer is uh, is plowing the field, and his beasts are thin and not very strong. So he plies the whip angrily, and he says, "Pull, damn you! Can't you pull? So we have food for the autumn." And the taxman says, "There, that farmer has damned his oxen. You must take them instead of me." No, nah, no, nah, says the devil. The, the farmer doesn't damn from the heart the beasts that pull his fields, that pull his fields. We, we'll, we'll go on, that's no good. Okay, so they go on, they come to the farmhouse itself, and the farmer's wife is making <coughs> food for her children. In particular, she is boiling rocks for soup, which will, you know, still the, the pangs for a little while. And the children are whining and crying, when will the food be ready? And in frustration, she turns and says, can't you be quiet, damn you, the rocks will be ready when they're ready. And uh, the taxman says, there, she's damned her own children. You must take them instead of me. Well, the devil's not going to take that. Uh, the mother does not damn her children from the heart. Give me a break here. So, uh, <coughs> so we must go on. But it turns out they don't have to go very much further. Just then, the farm wife spots the taxman, and she says, 
there's the swine that takes the food out of my children's mouths. I wish the devil had it. And the devil says, you know, I believe that damnation was fully endorsed by that woman's coherent extrapolated volition. And he takes the devil, uh, he takes the tax man away to hell, where presumably he will have the specks put in his eyes for the rest of eternity. <coughs> so, that's how they dealt with, with uh, taxes in the 19th century. But fortunately, the, uh, the various tax authorities of the world have caught on, and having a lot of money, they've just bribed the devil. So, uh, this is no longer very effective. But we do have some loopholes. We don't have hell on our side anymore, but we have the rough back door. So, um, it's said that when God closes a door, he opens a window. You, you may consult your Prius rabbi or, or other spiritual tender as to whether that's true of God, but it does seem to be true of Congress. Um, the door that they intended to close was individual retirement accounts for rich people. They did not wish rich people to be contributing to traditional IRAs and deducting uh, that contribution on their taxes. So they put in a limit. Uh, if your income is over so and so much, then you cannot deduct contributions to a traditional IRA, and you can't make contributions to a Roth IRA at all. But they missed one. You can still contribute money to your traditional IRA that you don't deduct an after-tax contribution. This is, of course, completely useless because you pay taxes on the money, you put it in the traditional IRA, and when it comes out again, you have to pay taxes again um, as regular income at that. Whereas if you put it in a brokerage account uh, and, and just let it grow, then you would only be paying the, the long-term capital gains tax, which is low, usually. I mean, everybody's circumstances are different, so, you know, but usual. <coughs> But once you've put an, an after-tax contribution in your traditional 401k, you're allowed, believe it or not, to roll it over to your Roth IRA. <laughs> and then it, is, it acts just as though you had made a contribution. So <laughs> that's why they call it the back door. And um, it is obviously a loophole. Congress can't possibly have intended that. But that does seem to be the plain text of the law. And, uh, and it, is the IRS's interpretation. Question at the back. Um, if you were leaking under the limit, and so you were deducting your contributions to the traditional IRA, then can you still do this rollover and just not pay taxes on either end? Or does it work differently? I think no. Uh, if, if you, no, no. If you have deducted your, um, your traditional IRA contribution, then you had better not try Let me think. Can you roll over uh, no. after tax money? I mean, pre tax money. No, no. I, no, 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 you can't. Th then you have to pay taxes as you do the rollover. Of course not. I'm, I'm being okay. sorry. I, I got confused for a moment between pre tax and after tax. Uh, now, you, you can do the rollover if you absolutely insist, but you do have to pay the taxes. Okay, however, um, there is one small problem with this approach which is called the intermingling rule. And this applies if you already have money in your traditional IRAs from previous years when maybe you were not making a tax salary. Um, so <coughs> when your new after-tax contribution enters your traditional <coughs> IRA, it intermingles, it fungus with, perhaps, your existing pre-tax money, and the IRS claims that, well, now we can't tell the difference anymore. So when you then make the rollover, you have to pay taxes on the percentage of pre-tax money that you have in your IRA. In fact, in all your IRAs. So you, you can't do the obvious fix of, well, here is my pre-tax traditional IRA, and I'll make a, a post-tax traditional IRA with this other provider over here. Uh, but what you can do, usually, is to move your pre-tax traditional IRA money into a 401k. Uh, that's legal. And, and once it's in the 401k, the IRS miraculously recovers the ability to tell it from your after-tax money. However, I have to give a small caveat here. Um, 
what I've just said is legal, but not every IRA or 401k provider will uh, give you the ability to do it. Um, 401ks can't, <laughs> don't absolutely have to accept money as rollovers from traditional IRAs. That's, that's up to the company providing it. So, you know, you have to investigate, can I do this before you, you lightly go off and take the money out of your traditional IRA? Uh, if you work for Google, you'll be fine. Uh, Google provides 401ks through Vanguard and uh, they can do pretty much everything except the dishes after dinner. But if you work for somebody else, you know, you just have to check first. So, my last bullet point uh, isn't so relevant if you have a tech job, because you almost certainly do have a 401k, but perhaps, as I do, you have a spouse who doesn't work, and, or, well, <laughs> she works, just not, just not uh, for, for a salary. <laughs> Taking care of two kids is a lot of down work, <laughs> but <laughs> she doesn't get paid for it, though. So, um, um, in that case, if your, your spouse has a pre-tax traditional IRA from when she did work, and you want to do the Roth rollover trick, but, well, she doesn't have a 401k, what are you going to do? The answer is you can establish a self-employed 401k for her. Um, assuming <coughs> that she's going to have a little bit of money coming in. You know, if, if you're saying, hey, I want a self-employed 401k, you have to have some kind of self-employment. In my wife's case, she's an author. She recently uh, got a book contract, so we're expecting some money to come in, which was really very convenient when I wanted to do the, the Roth factor this year. Uh, again, though, you have to be careful with the providers. I fortunately checked carefully. It turns out that a Vanguard self-employed 401k does not accept uh, rollovers from a traditional IRA. They're their 401k provided through Google does. So why, why their self-employed one doesn't, uh, I don't know. But anyway, I got, I got one with Fidelity that worked. So that's all. Um, now, a note on timing. Uh, you should be careful when doing your rollover from the traditional IRA to the 401k to do it in a year before you make your actual Roth battle contribution. So, uh, ideally, you will do the traditional IRA to 401k rollover in, let's say, December 2016. Then you will make an after-tax contribution for the year 2016 in January 2017, because you actually have until tax day the next year to make contributions to IRAs for, for the previous year. Um, and, and then we will do the roll, rollover. Uh, now, this is going to make your life a little bit complicated at tax time because you have to keep careful track of when exactly did you do what. But don't try to, to do the traditional 401k rollover in the same year as you do the actual Roth backup. Uh, then you'll have a problem. Okay, so that was the regular Roth backdoor. Now we come to the mega Roth backdoor which is misnamed. The most you can get into a Roth account per year through the, Roth, through the mega Roth backdoor is 53,000. Um, this year, anyway, obviously the, the limit increases year by year. And you'll notice that that's roughly 10 times what you can get in through the ordinary backdoor, which is 5,500 this year. So it should be a deca. 10 times backdoor. But okay, it was named by, by bloggers. Bloggers tend to be hyperbolic, and mega just means big in, mm -hmm. in today's sad world, so we're stuck with the mega Roth backdoor. Anyway, the trick is basically the same as the regular Roth backdoor, except it goes through your 401k. So you probably know that the limit on prefix contributions to a 401k is 18,000 uh, plus whatever your employer matches. Uh, but the total limit <coughs> of contributions to a 401k is 53,000. So where, where are these extra 35,000 coming from? Well, th th that's the limit on after-tax contributions. And as with the traditional IRA, it's basically useless because you're going to pay taxes on it, put it in your 401k, 
and then pay taxes again when you take it out. And as with the traditional IRA, you can do a rollover to your Roth IRA from your 401k um, if your provider allows it. So, you know, check it. So, in this manner, if, if you happen to have uh, 35,000 additional dollars per year to throw around, you can get them into your Roth IRA where they'll grow tax free and uh, multiply and be fruitful. Um, this is a genuinely great deal if you actually have that money and you know, aren't going to need it for some time. Uh, I, I don't understand why there's no intermingling rule for the 401k as, as there is for the IRAs, but such seems to be the case. Uh, I, I'm actually, <laughs> I must say that personally I find the, the pros in IRS notice 2014-54 uh, to be somewhat abstruse, but I have been informed by people I trust that it it conforms, that, that it lays out the interpretation I just gave. Okay, <coughs> we've done the back doors and we come to the health savings account, which, <coughs> although it has health in its name, should not be used for medical expenses, it should be used as a retirement account. Um, so contributions to an HSA are tax-free, same as a, a traditional IRA. Uh, most HSA providers will let you invest that money. Uh, the, the goodness of the investments can vary. Uh, so <coughs> some people will actually give you a, a brokerage account and you could in principle do day trading if you wanted. Some will have a, a small assortment of perhaps expensive mutual funds. Uh, so, you know, you have to think a bit about that. Um, a point to note, though, is that if if you get an HSA through Google, let's say, then they, they give you an insurance policy and they give you a, a standard HSA account, but you're not actually stuck with that HSA account. You can go to go to a bank or, or Vanguard or whoever and say, hey, uh, I, I would like to establish an HSA with you. And they'll say, well, do you have a high deductible uh, insurance policy? Yes, I absolutely do. Great, then, then we can establish that. And Sure, Google will put your, your HSA contributions into the default HSA, but once a year you're allowed to roll over from that HSA to the one you just, just established that perhaps has better investment options or something else you like. Okay, anyway. So wait, how do you qualify for an HSA? You must have a, uh, an insurance policy with basically a high deductible. Is this like an, there's an is there like some IRS thing that says these or like, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it would be too good a deal if you could uh, combine your, your HSA with uh, a, a uh, an insurance policy with a low uh, deductible and, and spend nothing on on health. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, again, if you are at the tech company, they they probably offer an, an HSA option. Um, so you may want to think a little bit about whether you actually want that or not, because the difficulty of a high, de high deductible insurance policy is, of course, that high deductible. Now, on a tech salary, I opine that it should be quite possible to pay an, an out-of-pocket maximum of, of 5,000 a year from just the, the money that is being showered down upon you. <laughs> so I, I know that opinions differ on this point. So you know, think it over. Anyway, uh, the, the, there are two dodges here. One is when you hit age 65, you can take the money out of the HSA whenever you like, whether it's for a medical expense or not. Uh, if it's uh, not for a medical expense, then you pay taxes on it. But they're just you know the regular income taxes. So in that sense, it works like a, a traditional IRA. If this for a medical expense, you don't have taxes. But in addition, if you're retiring early, say at age 50, age 45, whenever, then you can save up your medical expenses for like that. So I, I have one of these policies. Suppose I fall and break my leg tomorrow I, and I pay a large copay uh, at the hospital because I'm taken to the wrong one, whatever. I reach my out-of-pocket maximum, maybe even five thousand dollars, and I admit that I would rinse a bit at paying five thousand dollars all in one fell swoop. But there you go. 
Um, OK, so I document that expense to my HSA provider. And they say, OK, we, we see that you paid 5000 You can take that money out of your HSA. I'm not obliged to take it out right away. I can take it out whenever the devil I want, including 10 years later when I have, you know, Google has paid me one of those nice 16 times equity bonuses. <laughs> and, and I'm retiring on the $2 million in the bank. Well, and I, then I take out my 5000 and use them to pay the rent. Um, this now, I, I would hope that five thousand dollar expenses are not a yearly occurrence. But you can quite easily hit that limit if, say, you have a child or two children, as the case may be. Then you know that can get expensive on on, an, uh, on a high deductible policy, as as I learned to my cost at one point. But now, okay. So. <laughs> Now I'm going to talk about qualified dividends. <coughs> so you invest in, in some company, it pays dividends. Usually those dividends are what are called qualified and they're taxed at a low rate. Uh, sometimes they are unqualified dividends. As far as I can figure out, basically money that is from dirty foreign companies is unqualified. Uh, <laughs> at least small dirty foreign companies. If it's a large <coughs> dirty foreign company, then it is almost certainly uh, registered, listed on a US stock exchange, and then it will, in fact, be qualified. But you know, if you invest in an emerging markets mutual fund or something, then the dividends from that will probably be unqualified. And then you pay taxes on them as a regular income. Um, in addition, if you... Um, invest in a real estate investment trust, which is basically a mutual fund that buys commercial real estate, rents it out, and pays you the rents as dividends. Then again, that's unqualified. So <clears throat> you want to, if, if you are, you know, if you have a portfolio with complicated things in it, then you may want to think about where to put which things. And things that pay unqualified dividends should, if at all possible, go in a tax sheltered account. So I've got a, a priority list here. Uh, now, the Real Estate Investment Trust is at the top of the list for, for the following reason. Some of what you get from a Real Estate Investment Trust will be, let me see if I can remember the phrase, unrecaptured section 1250 gains. And if you have any of those in your income for the year, and you must fill out Schedule D. And Schedule D is a pain, quite apart from the actual taxes you're going to pay. That, that's not so bad, actually. But, <laughs> but Schedule D is a real... I hate it. Um, so my advice, if you want to invest in, in real estate, is twofold. Stick it in a tax-sheltered account if you can. If you can't, at least go big, because there's nothing more annoying than filling out Schedule D for a proxy fifty dollars <laughs> or a recaptured section twelve fifty gains, which, which I did uh, a weekend not too long ago. So I learned my lesson there, and now I'm passing it on to you. Of course, if if you're taking Warren Buffett's advice and and all your money is in a S and P five hundred fund, then you know just ignore this slide completely. Okay, so this is. Um, the most dubious trick I'm going to tell you about. To the best of my knowledge, I, I invented it independently. For all I know, it's common knowledge on the internet, but um, I have not personally tried it. So <coughs> take it with uh, 0 0.016 grams of sodium thorium. That uh, is sometimes known as a grain of salt. So if you contribute to an IRA, there is something called the saver's credit. If you make less than roughly 50,000, I don't recall the exact number, then you get a tax credit, not a deduction, but a credit that is a percentage of what you contributed. So um, you contribute 5,000, you get back $500 on your taxes. So this, this actually decreases the amount you owe or increases the amount you're, you're getting back. Um, this is, of course, a little bit not very interesting for people on a tech salary since the upper income limit is 50,000. But then it combines with the fact that Roth IRA contributions 
not, not what they earn, but just the contributions themselves can be taken up tax-free. So my thought is, if you, if you know somebody who earns 50,000 a year and whom you trust, you make them an interest-free loan of $5,500, they put it in their Roth IRA, they take the saver's credit, they uh, split the, the additional money from their tax return with you, then they take the contribution back out and give it back to you. <laughs> Net result, you've, you've uh, taken $550 or more, if they're particularly poor, out of, of uh, USG's budget. Um, again, I haven't tried it personally. <laughs> and as you know, I believe it's legal, uh, but this is now a government of men and not of laws, and perhaps you don't want to come to the negative attention of, of a, a paragraph rider in the IRS. I, I mentioned this mainly because I thought it was a neat loophole and not because I'm actually advising you to do it. Wait, but then for people who do make that amount of money, couldn't they just every year put the same 5000 in and take it back out? Or is that not how it works on there? They, they could, but uh, at, at, if you're earning $50,000, then 5500 is a pretty significant sum to come up with, right? But like, how long did that have to be in there for? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it, it's definitely a good question. I haven't looked into that because, you know, I didn't think anybody would seriously try it. No, I was just curious because, like, it seems weird that you could reuse the same 5000 that, that does seem to be strange, but <laughs> strange are the ways of Congress and the IRS. Related question. Um, so, someday I'm going to retire and not make any income anymore. Can I just do this with the money that I have then in the bank every year? Uh, it seems that you could, let's see, someday you'll be taking minimum required distributions from your IRAs and when you're doing that, I'm not sure if you're allowed to put money in as well. But if you're below the, the age where you're required <coughs> to take distributions, then it seems that yes, you could. Which is... <laughs> I, I think the IRS is relying here on the fact that most people are not coders and not gamers and not min-maxers and of course they are not savers either. Most people don't save any money. Uh, that's, that's why there are loopholes. It, I suppose that if a lot of people did this kind of thing then the loophole would be closed sharpish. Okay, so here are two things that I learned this year which may, <coughs> may be obvious to everybody else but I learned them this year so you know I've got to mention that. Um, so up until now, I have thought of itemizing deductions as being strictly for people who have a mortgage. Because if you're married filing jointly, then the standard deduction is 12,600. And there's, it's really very difficult to, to have enough itemizable deductions to get up to that sum without having a mortgage. Fortunately, California fixed that for us. By, by imposing what I think is the highest uh, income tax, state income tax in the US. It turns out state income taxes are deductible. So if you are on a tax salary in California, you may easily be paying 12,600 in uh, state income tax, and then it is actually to your advantage to itemize. Um, if you are perhaps an effective altruist in addition, and you make, uh, or an, an earner to give, and, and you, you know, <coughs> contribute a couple of thousand or ten thousand a year to charity, then, you know, so much better. Now you can deduct that as well. And of course, if you're single, then, then the standard deduction is 6,300, and it's even easier to get above that, either through the income tax or through charitable deductions or both. So, tax salary, at, at, least, at least glance at Schedule A and see if it will do anything for you. <coughs> Okay, the other thing is withholding allowances. So, when you pay your taxes, you have a certain number of exemptions. That's money that you don't pay uh, taxes on, which is in addition to the standard deduction. And basically, it's one for you, one for your possible spouse, and one for each of your kids. Um, but when you fill out uh, your W-4, which says, 
how many exemptions should my allower, uh, should my employer assume when they are withholding my income tax? Then there's what I just said, one for each dependent, and there's an, a so-called special allowance, which you can take if basically you have one you have one job or your household has only one job. Well, uh, that's I've got Admiral Akbar here saying it's a trap. It's not exactly a trap, but you have to think careful. Um, it turns out that this this special allowance is some kind of linear approximation that works for most people, so that um, when it comes tax time, if suppose you have uh, suppose you have you, your spouse, two kids, that's four exemptions, but you've been taking a special allowance, so you have five allowances. Well, uh, that will work out for most people between the four exemptions and the standard deduction, and you know, you'll, you'll come uh, closer to zero in, in what's either owed to you or owed by you. But it's, an, it's a linear approximation. Taxes are not, in fact, linear. The approximation breaks down for large salaries. Um, so publication 505 states that married filing jointly, you, you can run into trouble at salaries above 180,000. Well, that's tech salaries, right? So uh, you have to, okay, now it's not actually bad. Uh, you know, that means that instead of you lending the government money, the government is lending you money, interest free. Nevertheless, it was a bit of a shock for me uh, this this uh, year when I discovered that, oops, I uh, I owe two thousand dollars. <laughs> Fortunately, that's not enough that I had to pay a penalty on it. But you know, you you, you can take it, but think about it and, and check that it actually worked for you. Okay, that was the end of my uh, of my actual tax things, but I've got some some uh, music for you. Uh, okay, which is coming from my laptop and is, is perhaps not very audible to the rest of the room. Sorry about that. However, I put up the text so we can all have a, a rousing sing-song in the La La Scots if we choose. <laughs> Are there questions? Yes. What was the joke? Uh, figuring that out is left as an exercise for the listener. <laughs> um, so I know you said that your wife doesn't work, but for um, I, I know a lot of like women and people like, with both spouses are in tech. Uh, the marriage tax is really high, and I was wondering if you have any knowledge of ways around that. And the marriage tax, uh, <laughs> <Besides obvious. laughs> divorce for tax purposes. Sorry, uh, what I told you is what I got, and, and basically it's stuff that applies to my own situation. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Do you know how it compares to other countries in Europe, for example? Well, I can speak a little bit to the tax situation in Norway. Yeah. Uh, Norway, of course, doesn't really have much of a tech industry, or. <laughs> or that much of an upper middle class. Um, see, the thing is, Norway has a tax code that is rather more extractive than, than really? the US one, but it is also rather simpler, um, to the point that if, if your income is from wages, then uh, the tax authorities will, will send you your tax form pre-filled out every year, and what you basically have to do is check that the numbers look reasonable and, and sign, yeah, this is what I should be paying. Um, and how much do you pay? Like... 10%? 20, well, of course, it varies, but I mean, it's still a progressive scale, but um, I, I would certainly expect to pay a fourth of my income. Um, but yeah, basically, Norway doesn't have a... a tax filing industry lobbying to keep the code complicated and, and uh, <laughs> full of loopholes. <laughs> so you, uh, I've been assuming throughout that you fill out your own tax forms. That may, of course, not be accurate. You know, <coughs> all, all my uh, fulminations against Schedule D are perhaps a bit irrelevant if, if you just send your, your forms 1099 off to TurboTax and, and make them do it. In, in that case, you know, whatever. <laughs>
Okay, looks like that was it for questions. So uh, actually, then, oh, one sorry. more. Like, do you have some estimate of like if you put some money into an account that's actually text chapter for like actual interest income, uh, but you still have to pay tax on it when you put it in? Uh, how much gains do you get? Whatever in five years, ten years, twenty years, by keeping it there, and then only after cleaning it up. Okay. Um, like so, sorry, can, can you ask me the question again? <laughs> so basically, uh, so you usually can't really get around by around like paying taxes at all on income, but you can put it to places where you don't actually have to pay taxes on the actual <coughs> interest income on it, like dividends and capital gains and things. Oh. Um, or, or even you should pay that one, but like deferred and everything. Right, so, right, okay. so it's like kind of in percentage wise, how much is the effort worth? Uh, you know, at, at one point I was so interested in this that I, I wrote some scripts to simulate it. But unfortunately, that, that's a while ago, and I no longer remember the results. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I can't answer the question. I mean, the simple way to do it is write a script. Well, I mean, so like capital gains is approximately 35% in California. Mm -hmm. And so like, if, you're, if your 401k is going to be worth you know, $4 million in 30 years or something like that, you're paying 35% of <coughs> yes, but you wouldn't pay capital gains on the 401k, would you? Well, uh, I guess the point is if you put it in a, oh, if oh. you didn't put it in a 401k, you'd pay. Right, right, now it's your website. Right, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording and. Um,